Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of the American Civil War, which hosts Bang and Dang. And moving on in the year of 1863, as we have some uh, Ambrose Burnside, Department of Ohio action, happened in the Battle of Bluntville. Then we got the Army of uh, the Frontier, which I don't think we've even had these guys uh, majorly uh, yet. Francis J. Huron, we've heard his name, but he's uh, a while coming, ago. coming to Fort, Port Hudson for the Battle of Sterling's Plantation. And then we'll move on for the last battle of the night and move into the Battle of Baxter Springs, where uh, Quantrill and his raiders are up to no good again. Baxter uh, Springs Massacre, as they call it. I think we'll go over that one. Uh, yeah, Quantrill and his guys are not very good people. <laughs> Before we get there, head on over to our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. Give us a subscription, click the bell so you don't miss any videos. We put out little clips, shorts, and uh, obviously every week we have brand new episodes of Battles of American Civil War, Outlaws and Gunslingers, and according to Wikipedia and Lee and Corey on the case. Plus, you never know when we're going to drop a brand new Dart season video as well. So we got a lot of content going on over there. All right, give Lee and Corey a chance too, man. It's a little, a little I mean, let your, let your imagination flow for 18 minutes. Maybe I'll put a little something on the end of this episode, and uh, you guys can check out a little bit of Lee and Corey. Um, we should start doing that anyways to all of our shows, put out little snippets of right. all of our other shows on the shows. You know? right. um, yeah, so there. And if you're only listening on the podcast apps, give us a give us a favor, do us a favor, and uh, give us a review, and uh, maybe a comment or something. Get the algorithm going for us. We got the Battle of Bluntville starting out first. September 22nd, 1863, in Sullivan County, Tennessee, which occurred during a UN, Union expedition in, into East Tennessee, led by Major General Ambrose Burnside, who was the commander of the Department of Ohio, with the objective of clearing the roads and gaps to Virginia and securing the salt works in southwestern Virginia. Well, what are they doing? Are they going to uh, try to get an attack into Virginia here? Yeah, that's because West Virginia over there already is a Union. Somewhat. September 22nd, Union Colonel John Foster with his cavalry and artillery engaged Colonel James Carter and his troops at Bluntville. Foster attacked at noon and in the four-hour battle shelled the town and initiated a flanking movement compelling the Confederates to withdraw. Oh. Bluntville was an initial step in the Union's attempt to force Confederate Major General Sam Jones and his command to retire from East Tennessee. Sullivan County Courthouse in Bluntville was gutted by a fire that broke out during the shelling. It was rebuilt in 1866, though. Fantastic. And that, my friends, is the whole Battle of Bluntville, so I don't know if it's even a battle. But... Right. Moving on, the Battle of Sterling's Plantation, also known as the Battle of Fordach Bridge. Fordach. <clears throat> Is it like a Bayou La Forge? So is it like Fort Oach? Fort Oach. Fort Oach. Fort Oach. Fort Oach. Fort Oach. Oh, no. Sorry. Uh, well, it's the Battle of Sterling's Plantation anyway. Right, so. We'll call it that. Louisianians. <laughs> Took place September 29th, 1863 in Point Coupie Parish, Louisiana. That's how the internet said it. If we got it wrong, blame that. Right. Following the siege of Vicksburg, Union Major General Francis Herron's uh, division of the Army of the Frontier was transferred down the Mississippi River to become part of the 13th Corps. Is that what the hell? Arriving at Port Hudson on the 25th of July in 1863, they remained there until the 13th of August when they were moved to Carlton, above New Orleans. Just right. above New Orleans. Union Major General Nathaniel P. Banks had been ordered to invade and plant the flag in Texas, which plans resulted in the Second Battle of Sabine Pass, which we uh, covered, uh, I think, last episode it was. No, uh, episode before Chickamauga, September 8th, 1863. As part of his overall plan, Huron's division was to be transported to Morganza, Louisiana, below the mouth of the Red River. Mm. Both Confederate Brigadier General Tom Green's cavalry and Brigadier General Alfred Mouton's small infantry division were operating on the upper Atchafalaya River. Hey. Huron's movement would distract the Confederates from the invasion of Texas, and they hoped it would prevent the Confederate forces from moving to Texas had the Sabine Pass effort been successful. But it wasn't. Yeah. Can do anything about that. 5th of September, 1863, Heron's division was dispatched up to the Mississippi on transports, made a landing below Morganza on the 7th of uh, September. On the very next day, the entire force marched through Morganza and down the Opalasis Road 
uh, reaching the Atchafalaya in the afternoon. They retired to the Fardosh and camped there for the, ne- for the night. The next day, the division marched to Marganza, where they t- went into the camp. All right, September 11th. Huron proposed to send two planes. <laughs> <laughs> September 11th, Huron proposed to send a detachment back to the bridge over the Fort Doche to monitor Confederate activity on the west bank of the Atchafalaya and for Morganza in an attempt to draw out Green's cavalry from the west bank of the Atchafalaya. Mm. Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Bloomfield Leake of the 20th Iowa Volunteer Infantry Regiment was to be in command. A small provisional brigade was formed consistent of the 19th Iowa Volunteer Infantry under Major General Bruce. Hey, Bruce. The 26th Indiana Infantry under Colonel A.D. Rose, hey. a section of Battery B, 1st Missouri Light Artillery, and a battalion of the 6th Missouri Volunteer Cavalry under Major Samuel Montgomery. Montgomery Ward up in the S. C. Montgomery Burns. Oh, to supplement the cavalry, a, comp- a company of mounted infantry was created by drawing men from every regiment in the division and was led by Lieutenant Henry Walton of the 34th Iowa Volunteer Infantry. The road from Morganza to the Fordosh Crossing followed the east bank of Bayou Fordosh, running west to a point about three miles from Morganza. Then, following a turn into the bayou, ran south three and a half miles to a loop in the bayou by Norwoods Plantation. Just west of the Norwoods, the Opelousas Road forked to the northwest. It crossed the Fordosh and then ran on to the Atchafalaya across from present-day Melville, Louisiana. All right, so there's like a big old huge... Ziggly zaggly thing. Some runs, some runs. Shortly after leaving Morgans, <laughs> the force encountered Confederate pickets and skirmish with them throughout the day until they reached the Norwood Plantation about six miles from the Atchafalaya, where they went into camp. The country was unknown and Leak had no adequate maps. Right. Mouton saw Leak's exposed position as an opportunity to destroy this force around the Fardosh Bridge. We'll do it. What are you waiting for, bud? Ooh, uh, well, upon scouting the area on the 13th of September, Leak discovered the position at Norwoods was not very tenable. There were several old roads and a half-completed rail bed in the vicinity that would make it easier for the Confederates to move and get in his rear. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want that, man. <laughs> Pickets and posts were set out, and Leak requested to withdraw about a mile closer to the stern plantation. But this request was refused by Heron. He's like, no. What the hell, man? How would what? you even know what what's right. going on, Heron? You're not even there. All right. 15th of October. Nope. 15th of September, Leak learned from local people that an attack was expected, which resulted in his withdrawing two miles north to the... Uh, Sterling Plantation, and establishing his camps there. He's like, screw that, I'm leaving anyways. This position, though better than Norwood's, still had defects due to the roads that gave the Confederates easy ability to move around the Federal position. I don't want that. They just wanted to be on the plantation. Right. A levee ran along the east side of the road by the Sterling Plantation, and Leak had a gap cut in it north of the house so that the artillery could be moved through it if necessary. Oh, okay. Pickets were maintained constantly, but the force was so small that they were deemed to be inadequate, and the whole brigade was uneasy as to their position. Okay. Yeah, they're all, like, all right. looking around, and the Confederates were becoming increasingly visible and were often observed in small groups between Sterlings and Morganza. Although Heron was apprised of the rebels between him and Leek, he took no efforts to secure their rear. Wow. Jeez, dude, Heron, you're an idiot. Yeah, this guy, well, he was ill, Heron was. <laughs> And on the evening of the 28th of September, he turned over the command to Major General Napoleon Dana. All right, Dana, you going to do something? And then he was like, I'm going to New Orleans, guys. I don't feel good. <laughs> Mouton has realized the opportunity to gobble up his small force. And on the 19th of September, he ordered Green to plan an attack. He said, come on, Tom. Put your bum on their lips, baby. <laughs> with the final decision being made. <laughs> with the final decision being made on the 25th of September. Tom Green's 3,000 troops were at center point on Apalea on the 28th, and they commenced crossing by the ferry at about 3 p.m. Right. Waller's and Roundtree's cavalry battalions, together with Sammy's battery, they crossed by dark. All right. Next to over. cross were Spates and Mouton's infantry brigades, and finally, the 4th, 5th, and 7th Texas cavalry. The last crossing was at 1 a.m. on Dude. the 29th of September. The weather was very rainy that night. That just tells you that's only 3,000 people, and it took eight hours, not to, damn near 12 hours to cross everybody. Right. It's just ridiculous. And rain, too, so it got worse and worse right. and worse. Exactly. Oh yeah. The morning of the 29th, Mouton's and Spates' brigades were sent by trail through the woods and swamps that intersected the Opelosis Road and about uh, two miles north of the Sterling Plantation. Mouton was to remain in this position to block any relief force that might be sent from Merganza, and Spates' uh, brigade would launch the primary attack on Leak's right and rear. Oh. 
The balance of the Confederate cavalry marched via the road towards the Fort Osh Bridge near the Norwood House. Okay. Arriving there about 11 a.m. and commenced skirmishing with the Federal cavalry pickets at the Fort Osh Bridge. After about a half hour, sounds of firing was heard to the north at the Sterling Farm. Uh oh. Okay. Uh oh. Just before noon, a shot was heard from around the world. <laughs> The picket post north of camp at Sterling's was being bombarded. And then more shots were heard from the cane fields to the north and then to the east of the house as well. Uh-oh. Mouton had begun his attack. Leak, he ordered the artillery up the road and in position at the gap in the levee to fire across the cane fields. <laughs> the 19 Iowa was ordered to a fence running east to west behind the house and to start firing, boys. Whatever you see, blow them down. Beat them up. 26 Indiana was then posted to the left of the 19th facing west, and they are ordered to fire obliquely to the right. For some reason, the artillery had not made it to the gap in the levee. Why? They were being moved by hand among the outbuildings behind the house where they were totally useless. Leak had available only 450 infantry, as so many were on picket. Both the 19th and 26th were pushed back from the position through the Sterling buildings and took up a position on the levee, now facing east, with the levee serving as an excellent breastwork, though. Oh. The Confederates were in overwhelming force and initially attempted to turn the right. Of the 19th. Did it, right. We're going to try. At that time, the 26th was pulled out, placed on the 19th's right, with the 26th now facing south. Right. Seeing the change in the front, the Confederates now moved to the right, and they poured through the gap in the levee, uh, attempting to turn the left flank of the 19th. Right. Like, we're not going to get the right. We'll go to the left then, right. obviously. The weather was hot, and the men were spent. Leak had been shot in his foot. <laughs> oh, shit. He was unhorsed. And then captured. Oh, no. And due to confusion, no other officer assumed command. Oh, meanwhile, the Confederate cavalry had completely routed the Federal cavalry. Oh, my. Uh, to the south near the Norwood Farm. Usually happens that right. way. Right. The Federal cavalry streamed away towards Morganza with such rapidity, rapidity that none of them were captured. Good for them. The routed cavalry passed to the east of the Sterling Plantation and the fight raging there. They said, bye, we're not even helping you guys. All right. Infantry at Sterling's were so involved. <laughs> <It's blue on laughs> like, I don't care what's going on here. They were so involved with their own fight that they were not aware of what had happened to their cavalry. Oh, wow. oh geez. The, the people at Sterling's. Right. So they didn't even know. Uh, nobody knows what's going on with the Union right now. Especially with what's his face captured. Right. They don't even, probably nobody even knows. Right. They said nobody could assume, assumed command. Idiots. Most of the time, Green's cavalry were clothed in Union uniforms that had been captured at Brashear City three months before. Mm. With the flight of the Union Cavalry, Green advanced his column up the road for Norwoods to the Sterling Plantation. The Union infantry absorbed the advancing column and, and supposed them to be the 6th Missouri. They're like, oh, it's the 6th. Come on, boys. All right. Not until they, they were fired upon did the Union uh, infantry realize that this was Tom Green's cavalry coming in on their other flank. Oh, like, oh no. Vastly outnumbered, leaderless, and assailed from all sides. The, the Federals surrendered. Wow, so they're just like, we're giving up? Ah. Only a few Union infantry managed to escape. The Federals lost 16 dead, 45 wounded, 454 prisoners. Damn. Confederates' losses were 26 dead, 85 wounded, and 10 missing. Jeez. Additionally, the Confederates took two 10-pounder parrot rifled guns with caissons, two new ambulances, oh, wow, and nice. one hospital wagon loaded with medical supplies. That's a score. All right. And all the arms of the captured men. Green quickly consolidated his prisoners and spoils and moved back to the river, crossing it as quickly as possible. Right. Prisoners were then marched via Alexandria, Natchitoches, Mansfield, and Shreveport to the Camp Ford Prison near Tyler, Texas, where they arrived on October 23rd, 1863. It's a hell of a march. You ain't getting some bitch. Wow. Natchi, Nat, Natchitoches, whatever. Natchitoches? Sure. Yeah, that was a decent little battle there, though, I guess. Yeah. Not too bad. Uh, moving on, the Battle of Bastard... Bastard... <laughs> little Bastard Springs. Uh, the Baxter Springs Massacre. Or uh, sometimes it's called the Battle at Baxter Springs. Minor battle fought 6th of October 1863 near the present day town of Baxter Springs, Kansas. I guess it was a minor battle when nobody could fight back, huh, bud? Wasn't a battle, it was a massacre. What? I don't know. William Quantrill, we all know what he did before, decided to attack Fort Baxter and divided his force into two columns. One under him and the other commanded by a subordinate, David Poole. Oh, David Poole. Can never trust a guy named David. Right. Or Poole. I don't know. Poole <laughs> and his men proceeded down to the Texas Road. 
uh, where they encountered Union soldiers, most of whom were African Americans. Oh no, you already know how these guys feel about the African Americans. Yeah, no. They chased and attacked the Union troops, killing some before the soldiers reached the earth and log Fort Baxter. What a shitty fort. All right. The garrison there consisted of about 25 cavalry, 65 to 70 infantry of the United States colored troops. Hmm. Poole's column attacked the fort, but the garrison fought them off. First Lieutenant James Burton Pond received a Medal of Honor for leading the defense of the fort. The citation for his Medal of Honor reads, For extraordinary heroism on the 6th of October, 1863, while serving with Company C, 3rd Wisconsin Cavalry, in action at Baxter Springs, Kansas. Right. While in command of two companies of cavalry, First Lieutenant Pond was surprised and attacked by several times his own number of guerrillas, Uh-oh. but gallantly rallied his men, and after a severe struggle, drove the enemy outside the fortifications. First Lieutenant Pond then went outside the works and, alone and unaided, fired a howitzer three times, throwing the enemy into confusion and causing them to retire. Oh. Wow. The American flag remained standing over the fort thanks to the bravery of the second colored infantry who helped rally the federal soldiers. Oh, that's fantastic. Good for them. All right. That's fantastic. Moving out onto the prairie, Quantrill's column encountered a Union detachment escorting Major General James Blunt, who was moving his command headquarters Yo, south. beautiful. I almost forgot. Right. He was moving his command headquarters south from uh, Fort Scott, Kansas to Fort Scott. Fort Smith, Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> Fort Scott. <laughs> Fort Scott. Yeah, he was moving his uh, headquarters from Fort Scott, Kansas to Fort Smith, Arkansas. Okay. Quantrill's men greatly outnumbered the Union forces. Wearing federal uniforms and thereby taking the federals by surprise, Quantrill's column killed most of the detachment, including many who attempted to surrender. Among the dead was a military band. Major uh, Major Henry Curtis was a son of Major General Samuel Curtis. Oh no! Yeah. Also, Johnny Fry, who was the first official. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Fry. <laughs> uh, Johnny Fry was the first official westbound rider of the Pony Express. Oh, well, shit. And also a total of 103 other men. Damn. Well, also killed was James R. O'Neill, who was an artist correspondent for Leslie's Weekly. Oh, no. When a few men escaped to Fort Baxter, when a few men escaped to Fort Baxter, soldiers went out to search for survivors. There were few, but Blunt, yo, beautiful, <laughs> was among them. Uh, After the massacre of his troops, Quantro sent, well, Blunt's troop, Quantro sent a demand ordering Pond to surrender the fort. Pond refused. Uh-oh. Quantro's subordinate, William T. Anderson, known as Bloody Bill, yeah, that guy wanted to attack the fort again, but Quantrill refused, and the guerrillas left for Texas. Oh, what a pussy. <laughs> Why? Might as well attack. Getting in the fort? Yeah, of course you Needless can. casualties for nothing. What's the fort got? Well, Blunt was moved from command for failing to protect his column. Blunt? But Not going to be able to hear your uh, names uh, anymore. Well, he was soon restored. Oh. <laughs> Union supporters <laughs> called the killings a massacre. Yeah, I'm sure they did, but didn't call the, the uh, Union slaughter of the, the Indian women and children up north uh, a, a massacre, though, did you? Yeah, that was a massacre. Uh, the conflict at Baxter Springs was characteristic of the vicious Kansas-Missouri border warfare. Fort Baxter was temporarily reinforced, but by the end of 1863, the Union Army... Union, piece of cunt. <laughs> the Union Army pulled its troops back to Fort Scott. Oh, Fort Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Which was better fortified. All right. Um, so bye-bye at Fort Baxter, huh? Right. Before abandoning the fort, the United States forces demolished it, and they removed everything usable to prevent use by the enemy. Quantrill and Anderson, they would continue to, uh, to disagree on conducting warfare on the Kansas-Missouri border. By the year of 1864, the two split. They're like, you know what? You take your guys and take mine. They're like, whatever. This was limited, uh, limiting bushwhackers used to fighting in Missouri only. Hmm. Baxter Springs later developed... As the first cow town in Kansas. Nice. A way station for cattle drives to markets and railroads further north. Oh, so it's a way station too, dude. That's great. Not like a way station wait. Right. right. Let's just hold up here. Right. You can store your cows, get some uh, food, get some food, get a bath maybe, right. and mm-hmm. on to North Dakota or something. Get a whore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> By 1875, it had a population around 5,000 people. Good for them, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I don't know if that was a massacre compared to... Well, other massacres, but it kind of was a massacre when 103 people were killed. Well, I don't think these guys suffered nothing. They're soldiers. Massacre is still a massacre, man. Just because you're a soldier doesn't mean you can't get massacred. <laughs> what, are you exempt from that? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's it for this episode. Nice little short one, 22 minutes or so, probably. Um, I mean... Don't like to overwhelm you with no. seven uh, battles. No, that's good. It's 
plus the next one, they kind of all go together when it's the Battle of Blue Springs, the Battle of First Auburn, you got the Battle of Bristol Station, and the Battle of Second Auburn. Those last three, literally, well, actually, it's First Auburn, Second Auburn, and then Bristol Station, but those last three literally are like, they, sh- they should be one battle, to be honest right. with you, but they're three separate ones. Um, yeah, and then we'll have four there next week, and then we'll continue moving on because that's uh, we're already in... Approaching the end of October, so we only got a couple more months to 1863 until we get to 1864 and ultimately wind down this war that should have been probably over a long, long time ago. Yep, yep, yep. What with that? Let's go check out this week's episode of Outlaws and Gunslingers, where we cover the namesake of the Bonanno family, Joe Bonanno. And a uh, decent little story he had. Disappears for a while, then some bloodshed, then he comes back. Has a heart attack and moves to Tucson. All right. And he survived all that time. He never got convicted either. Uh, Until he was old. I think. Maybe. And then this week's episode, according to Wikipedia, where we finish up the uh, article on Industrial Revolution Part 2. Next week's article is going to be about Venice, Italy. Hey. And then uh, next week as well for the... Outlaws and Gunslingers is going to be about Nicolo Shiro, who was one of the first bosses of the Bonanno family. So, got a lot going on. Also, go check out our YouTube once again at Bang Dang Network for all these shows, plus Dart League, plus Lee and Corey. And if you are listening on podcasts, make sure you give us a review and a like and a whatever they do over there on podcast apps. We'll be back next. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back next week for more Battles of the Makers yeah, of the War. We are the Mouth of the Music Anders with...